The state of Illinois pipelined me as a child so that the state could receive large sums of money to build adult prisons in the state. I was part of the building of the school to prison pipeline beginning in Chicago in the 1990s. Chicago was birthing a horrific crime against its children. The state created a way to prosecute children with a zero tolerance policy in schools and hit them hard tactics. This was for the state to receive money for juveniles incarcerated and putting that money into building the adult prison systems. Basically, children were captured, taken from their childhood, and housed in a cage like cement cell with no sunlight for the state to collect money at their expense. I was one of these children. The state used the school to prison pipeline to own me like an animal. I was owned by the state as a ward of the court. The state of Illinois was my parent and I became a number, locked away from daylight or affection or anything humane in the name of school policy. Illinois held many children captive so the state could collect money and put it into building adult prisons. Illinois is still continually actively trying to take rights away from parents by enforcing extreme school policy and fight against parents for their own children. Illinois is fighting for stricter policy with harsher punishments. They are fighting to take rights from parents by pushing school policy that is draining pockets, time, and valuable, lasting impressions left on our children. The democratic state is trying to take our children and indoctrinate them into global agenda while forcing the parents into the dark with no say over their own children, all in the name of education. We need to keep family first and fight back against this globalist agenda.
At just 14 years old, Justin is a prisoner inside Pendleton Juvenile Correctional Facility, a maximum security juvenile prison where up to 400 boys ranging in age from 10 to 21 are locked up for charges ranging from drug possession to rape to murder. And it can be a really scary place. I've spent nearly two decades filming inside countless juvenile facilities and prisons. They are immensely sad confines where black and brown kids make up the overwhelming majority of faces behind bars. Their life stories are often tragic from a very early age, leading to anger, lack of hope, and all too often, a life in prison. I've always been in trouble. I've always been a juvenile. I got in a fight and gave somebody 15 stitches in his eye. Once you pull that trigger, it feels like it starts to twitch and you can't let go. And I thought he was going to swing back, but he didn't, so I just kept on swinging on him. I figured the only way I can eat is to rob somebody. What do you oh, got? What is gotta... that? <laughs> you got candy. Is that candy? <laughs> but Justin is not your typical inmate. And it was while filming at Pendleton Juvenile, when the prison was complete madness, that Justin caught my eye. Clearly, this was a boy with special needs, and after 17 years of doing this work, even I had to ask myself, what in the world is this child doing here? Hey, go get off that gay <laughs> Woodrum, Woodrum. He knows on the gay <laughs> Come here, kid. What? Sure. I hear about this. You hear me? Yeah. Uh, Justin, please get off the door. You have an injury. Oh my. I bet you can not speak that language. I bet I could. He's learned all this here. It's in there. Kate Frazier is a counselor at Pendleton Juvenile who has this extraordinary gift of working with these very troubled kids. And Kate really took Justin under her wing because she realized he had developmental disabilities. Hey, give me my candy. Hey, I'm Jimmy. Uh, what did you say? Please, please, thank you for not Ooh, what so Kate knows Justin better than anyone, and he is what the prison calls a one on one child. His mental disabilities are so severe that they have to have one staff with him. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hey, get out of there. What is his IQ level? His you... IQ level is around 40. 40. Mm-hmm. And he's placed at this facility based upon the needs because at this facility there is 24-hour medical care here. And because his IQ level and his functioning level is so low, he can't participate in the normal programming. like a regular juvenile student is that's here. He can't take that in. He's not, his level of functioning is not enough to where that he understands anything that's being worked with. Justin is a perfect example of a, of a kid who was here for all the wrong reasons. Yet he, he absolutely did some things that were wrong, but when you look at his trauma that he'd been through and you look at his, his mental health situation and things like that, you know, all prison did was make him worse. Mike Dempsey is the superintendent at Pendleton, and Mike has worked in prisons for decades. But he's inherited a mess at Pendleton. You been here before? Yes. Many of our kids that we have here, and Justin's a good case, he has nowhere to go. Today I talked with a man who was locked up as a teenager in the youth prison in St. Charles, and he says the millions of dollars needed to keep these prisons running could be much better spent. Come on, JB. Set our youth free. Come on, JB. Set our youth free. Tucked away in the green fields of Kane County is a massive 127 year old facility that can hold nearly 350 kids. But right now, there are only about 30 juveniles incarcerated at the Illinois Youth Center St. Charles. How old were you? I was like, probably, like, probably 15, 16. Sharif Polk used to be one of them. But the whole idea of like, 
you're still a human, you know what I'm saying? You're still a person before this 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 position that you have, you know what I'm saying? So my experience and the conditions, man, it was, it was really, it was really horrible. Polk isn't the only one who feels that way. Just two years ago. They're behind fences and barbed wires, right? They're not animals, they're human. Anne Marie Brown worked as an outreach worker inside the prison walls. Now she's calling for its closure. So you put them in a hostile environment like that, and then you realize why they, you know, may act out or may not feel like they want to be here or are crying for help. Now both have joined the final five campaign dedicated to closing the five youth prisons left in Illinois, a goal that Governor J.B. Pritzker announced his support for a year ago. In fact, a lot of the evidence is very clear that it hurts them um, and it promotes increased likelihood of criminal behavior when, you know, when they're older. Jennifer Volan Katz, executive director of the prison watchdog John Howard Association, says the research points to the fact that prison budgets could be better spent on community-based rehabilitation and treatment services. In 2021, $26 million was budgeted to run St. Charles. What do we want? We are you. When do we want it? Now. These advocates say the process of closing these prisons needs to happen much more quickly because every day, more and more kids are having their first pivotal interactions with our criminal justice system. They're human, they deserve to be able to laugh and love and you know, have pain and hold this trauma and be able to talk about it like anybody else. The Warrenville is a really unique facility within Illinois DJJ because it's our only co-ed facility. It's the facility where all of our girl population um, comes to for reception and classification and for the duration of their stay. We also house vulnerable and young male youth here. DJJ switching over from IDOC was actually the initiation of us trying to transition from adult consequences to more childlike disciplinary actions. We really looked at our policies around um, use of confinement, use of force, use of discipline. IDJJ handled the youth with care. Our director, Heidi Mueller, um, she changed our mission to be more effective. We paired that with sort of a massive training push. Um, so we trained our staff in a new and different approach to use of force, uh, to behavior management that really relies much more heavily on um, crisis de-escalation and at the core on the relationship that staff and youth build together. I think for staff, the scary part is, is trying to understand why the youth are acting the way they are. So with the training, being able to uh, learn and teach de-escalation skills, um, I think that gave us a broader understanding of the, the different levels with, uh, with the youth behaviors and being able to respond to them adequately. Today, we, we'd much rather not use physical restraint, let alone mechanical restraints. We just much rather have the conversation with the young person and allow them to come to, you know, allow them to make the good decisions because they can and they will if you allow them to talk it through. I'm part of the Staff Crisis Response Team, also known as SCRT for short. That was developed in 2018. We realized there was a need for an immediate therapeutic support for staff members, security and non-security. I think this helps staff deal with difficult situations just knowing they have the support. Our staff wellness committee came a few years ago when we were having a lot of physical intervention incidents. Staff responding to poor youth behavior and it just was like this like dark wave over the facility. So we thought about ways to get staff together and kind of boost morale. Throughout the year, they do bring in different services for help, uh, for staff just, just to uh, to ease the tension and to be able to de-escalate or to reduce stress. Um, one of those is uh, massages. Um, a company came in and offered free massages for staff. And just, um, I think th that overall helped staff uh, de-stress. There's different kinds of the stresses that add to just this environment. It's partially the kids and and policy and just our own everyday lives. When I walked in these doors, everyone was welcoming. It was my first time seeing smiles in a long time. They were just so nice to me that it was just a completely different environment. The staff and kids are, it's like their family. I mean, I've seen so many staff 
just get more excited than kids' parents would about them passing their GED. I can't say it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling and I am being trusted. So to me, I feel it in the heart that they giving me the opportunity to get in this program while I'm in here. Ms. Bowen is the first person I met and she, she welcomed me with open arms. She got me food because I hadn't been able to eat for like a week. Um, she got me food, water, and she just talked to me and asked me how I was doing for the first time in a long time. My name is Diane Bowen, and I'm a youth and family specialist here at IYC Warrenville, and I've been here for 24 years. And my role is that I'm the reception counselor and I'm the person that the kids meet when they're first brought to Warrenville. My first day here, meeting Ms. Bowen calmed me, in a sense, with her outgoing personality and her friendly personality. When they first meet me, when they get here, they're nervous. Um, they don't know what to expect. Um, they're scared. And so my role when they're coming in is to make them feel comfortable, explain to them what IYC Warrenville is, what it entails, what's gonna happen, what's gonna take place, to try to bring that barrier down to make them feel a little bit more comfortable. Having a black face, you know, a black staff around me, it was different because I felt as if I had someone around that could relate to me. I like to call it cultural confidence because when you around people who are culturally like you, you automatically have a feeling that I can relate to them or I can talk to them. What I have found throughout my career is that when youth feel comfortable, confident, wherever they're living, whatever unit they're living on, when they feel comfortable that they can talk with a staff member and divulge whatever's happening, any kind of emotional distress that they have, that there's a certain peace that happens, a certain comfort that happens because they know they, they're not alone. And at IYC Warrenville, they're not alone. Somebody is always here to help them. The use of physical intervention has dropped significantly now. Um, we are de-escalating them verbally. We, um, we listen to their needs. We want to talk to them.
wonderful that the 3 million members or 6,000 delegates of the National Education Association, which I really think should be renamed to the National Extremist Association, showed that they're not ready to get rid of the terms mother and father from schools either. And I think this is just one more um, sign that, that really teachers unions, the K-12 cartel in America now, as I refer to them, uh, don't represent the teachers across America and certainly don't represent parents and children. Well, I want to get their statement now because we, we do have it, and this is a, in, in part NEA with the National Education Association is committed to the democratic processes and open debate. These values are fundamental, not just to NEA's vision as a union, but to our functioning as a multiracial democracy. So they make the argument here that essentially this is part of an, un, you know, it, it's a discussion. They're talking about this. What do you think about the, the amount of effort, the time uh, put into this potential idea? I, I think that they're talking about this and what American parents would like them to be talking about is literacy. We have a literacy crisis in this country with two thirds of fourth graders not reading on grade level. The National Education Association is more interested in political activism than they are in teaching our children. And uh, we, again, we do not believe that the majority of teachers in America uh, agree with this nonsense. And we look forward to the teachers union losing more teachers um, every single day. You know, this is an absolutely massive union. So they really, uh, in, in theory and in practice, may have a significant impact on what's going on uh, with children in classrooms all across America. But this language didn't, it, it didn't happen. They, they, they didn't do it. Do you think that they received a pushback uh, on this? And, and you mentioned that perhaps they should be focusing on other things. Do you think this was halted based on, on pushback? Yes, absolutely. Uh, normal American people don't say chest feeding person or birthing person. We say mom and dad. It shows that the union is completely out of touch. Hopefully they're getting that message. We would like them, again, to focus back on teaching and learning. They talked about foreign policy, guns, abortion, climate change, but not teaching and learning at their representative assembly. So again, you know, it's very important for American parents to understand you've got 6,000 delegates from the National Education Association meeting to have these discussions. Does that fill filter back into the classroom, and I think American parents are very concerned that it will. They, you know, the yearly meetings, they have these gatherings. What do you think that American parents all across uh, uh, the country can do when they're, when they're aware of these type of discussions going on? What can they do to inf influence an organization, you know, that, that, that is this big? I think parents can build relationships with teachers. At Moms for Liberty, we're all about building relationships with school board members, with school administrators, with teachers. I think it's important that we partner with our children's schools. What we're not willing to do at Moms for Liberty is co-parent with the government. And that's what this is. This, that's what this effort of the unions is. It, they have an undue influence in our children's education. They kept schools closed. They put up for a vote forcing masking and COVID vaccines for all children in America. So again, Teachers unions, get back to teaching kids and focusing on reading and let the rest of Americans worry about raising our children. Thank you. You know, you, you bring me back to this place where over the course of the last year and particularly in the pandemic, uh, parents have sort of risen up and they have pushed back against either the union or the school boards in their communities about everything uh, from masking to stay at home, learning from home, uh, when to reopen schools. Uh, so. It, as we're heading into an election year, here we are, we're, we're the midterms just a few months away. Do you think we're going to be hearing a lot from parents that are talking about what they want to see happen with education as we're trying to still recover from the losses during the pandemic? Absolutely. Parents are awake. Moms and dads are the true political party in America, and we are joyfully advocating so the current and future generations of our country will be able to reach their fullest potential. 2022 is the year of the parent, and the union better watch out because there are parents and community members running for school boards all across the country, and we are reclaiming public education in America. And you have a lot of energy, Tiffany Justice. Thank you so much uh, for sharing a little bit of that energy and your insight with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you.